broadens it out. Let me turn this competition off. Of that's great. Father, we we're uh, thankful again for another opportunity to fellowship together around your word, to fellowship with thee and with one another and use this, Lord, as a, an opportunity and a time to encourage one another, strengthen one another, uh, allow your Holy Spirit to do his office work in us and uh, um, mold us closer together and uh, with you in such a way as um, you will be more visible in our individual lives and in our service and in the fruit that we bear. I'm committed at this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, today morning. we spend uh, uh, a good morning. Good morning. We're going to um, be most of the time today in uh, Leviticus 16, as we try to wrap up, if you will, our our look at the um, the mercy seat in the tabernacle. And uh, just as a uh, touch point from where we were last week, remember the mercy seat in the uh, in Scripture is a single word. We have two words for it. We call it mercy seat. You remember what it, what the one word is? If you do, you're going to amaze me. You love it. Pour it. <laughs> yeah, right. Pour it. Yeah, just come up here. Pour it. And that's what it means. Propitiatory. Now, what does propitiatory mean? What takes place uh, that makes something propitious? No replacement. Uh, it's close. It's like like a replacement, right? An acceptable replacement. Yeah, an right. acceptable replacement. It literally means, um, uh, propitiatory means it satisfies the demand. Something that propitious, um, a pagan would call it pacifying and they pray to their false gods and, and they think they're gonna get benefit from it. So they do things that they think are gonna please that false god. And um, if they, Please, that false god that's propitious, it satisfies the false gods. <clears throat> In the scripture, we have a God, the true and the living God. And there are things that satisfy him and things that don't. And um, the mercy seat, if we don't use that term, we'd have to use the word propitious. The place to find satisfaction with God in the tabernacle setting. The place to find, to make God happy. Satisfy him. You might even use the word pacify. Uh, uh, I love its meaning in the New Testament because uh, the blood of Christ was propitious. That is, it's a demand of God and it's the only thing that will satisfy him. That's propitiation. You got to remember that word because it's in a it's a good New Testament word. It's, that is uh, the place of um, of uh, satisfaction to God, and it comes from this word. It's based on this word. Um, I think it's kofar. I'm not sure I say these Hebrew words, but whatever however you pronounce it, this word means. Uh, the price of a life. This word comes from that one. Something that's propitious uh, comes from a word that means the price of a life. And it can sometimes is translated ransom. Ransom, good New Testament word. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, the reason I point back to this is because when we're studying the, the tabernacle, we're still studying uh, that which in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the coming Messiah. His person, who he is, what satisfies him. Uh, it's a study of um, the, uh, 
the personal work of Christ in a sense that in the New Testament, we read things, but we can look back on the, the shadow that foreshadowed it and learn things about him, about the Lord, that we might not pick up very readily in the New Testament. Because what God is doing is he's laying the foundation for us to understand who that coming Messiah is and what, he, what he's going to do and what he's going to accomplish. And so when we're looking at the Old Testament uh, picture we're calling the tabernacle, we find things there that tell us about Christ we would learn in no other place. And what it did for Israel is it set their mind also with um, God's um, picture of what his Savior, his Redeemer, his uh, Messiah is going to do, not only for Israel, but for the world. That's why I just wanted to touch base with this. This is the satisfying place uh, for man and God to meet together and for him to be satisfied. And then we want to finish, we were talking about just now, uh, propitiation. We know that in the Old Testament, what did the sacrifices accomplish? God gave them sacrifices, and they were of what nature? Well, the burnt offering? Oh, that's one, one, one way they did it, but... They didn't pay for it, they just covered it over. Thank you. Well, yeah, my, what I'm asking, brought... what was the sacrifice? that was being made? What was it that was satisfying God? What were they obeying that... Um, oh, blood. Oh, yeah. hmm. that, of sheep and goats. Yes. Bulls. And bulls. Then he tells us later, or he tells us that the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and all, do, do did not satisfy. Well, then what do you have to do it for? <laughs> There's probably many answers to that question, but for the me, main one is he did that to show us uh, and to illustrate, to foreshadow uh, that the coming person and work of Messiah is going to be based on the Messiah's blood. blood. It's a blood sacrifice. Here he's illustrating it with the use of animals. Mm -hmm. It's a, it, the, the example, of course, always falls short. A shadow falls short of reality, but it's pointing to reality. And then later we get to see the connection between the two and uh, what it uh, really means. And in the Old Testament, they, um, they had, it was a different life setting than what we live in today. They were not born again. They didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. But what God was preparing them to do for the coming of that was to prepare them in a way that uh, they understood that, um, uh, and he built on the understanding there, there's order to what we're going to do this morning, uh, this kind of an order, in which he's illustrating uh, these things with uh, the law here with the um, with the uh, mercy seat in the uh, temple tabernacle, and uh, so uh, what he has the people of that day doing, the believers of that day doing, was he set up the tabernacle. He set up, gave them the law, and uh, what they were to do was obey the law, have a right relationship with God personally, spiritually. Uh, they weren't born again, but they had a personal relationship with God because they could sacrifice, they could obey all of the um, temple worship and so on and still not be right with God. That's why we have a lot of Old Testament passages that tell us that, that God would rather have our hearts than our works. Hosea 6.6 6 is a prime example of that. God says, I want your heart a lot more than anything you can do for me. I first and foremost want your heart. I don't have your heart. I don't want your works. I don't need them. That's my interpretation. 
<laughs> so, uh, but I point this out for this reason. What made God happy, what satisfies God, what was propitious to God in the Old Testament days is that they, that an individual loved him and served him according to his desires, according to his plan, his purpose, his ways. So he gave them the law, and he also gave them uh, the tabernacle and this means of worship. And this is what uh, would a person in that day, when he realized or she realized there was sin in her life or his life, they would get the proper sacrifice for that type of sin and go to the priest. And the priest would intervene and the priest would take that sacrifice uh, and deal with it in the under the God's instruction. And that person then would have satisfied uh, God and that he did what God wanted him to do with that kind of sin. I hope I'm getting that point across. That made the Old Testament sacrificial system and ways propitious, and that was called atonement. And uh, Tim said, well, yeah, they cover up. They didn't really get rid of their sin, but it covered it up. That's all God wanted to do at that time. He wanted their love, their heart, and they wanted them, and to demonstrate that with their obedience to what his demands were. Demands were the sacrifice. A foreshadowing type. Whether they knew that or not, it was a foreshadowing type. But uh, uh, what's important is to them, how was a man made righteous? How was a man righteous in the Old Testament? He was uh, righteous in the Old Testament by obeying, obeying God uh, according to God's demands and requirements. And, and uh, that was what God wanted from them at that time was atonement. He wanted their sins to be dealt with. And the difference between back then and today is uh, they would be dealt with by confession, confessing their sins, making their sacrifice, and God would count them okay. That's all I would say to it. That satisfies God. Propitiation in the Old Testament was done through atonement. And it was done through atonement for what reason? Why did God cover up sin? That was all that was available at that time. Yeah. There wasn't a perfect sacrifice at that mm -hmm. time. Well, you have a plan for the future. Mm -hmm. They have it corrected. Yes. And it was uh, foreshadowing what Christ would do. Mm -hmm. Plus, I, I think in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you always had to have faith. Sure, absolutely. And, and that's, that's the main thing is that faith is always maintained throughout yeah. and we can see how God responded to men and women of faith as he dealt with them all through uh, all, all through history up until the time of the Messiah himself mm -hmm. so propitiation uh, in the Old Testament was what God wanted and it foreshadowed the real answer just like these sacrifices foreshadowed the one real sacrifice coming. So the satisfaction of God in the Old Testament was um, atonement. And we know that that word just means God answered those requests, those sacrifices. He, he um, took the sins being confessed and given an uh, um, example of by um, sacrifice, that God was satisfied that, and that was by hiding him. He took care of him, but he wasn't, he put him in the garbage can, but he wasn't going to empty the garbage can until later. <laughs> um, uh, I've always used this illustrate about a, a woman having an important visitor come to a special friend come to her, her house to visit and she didn't have time to clean so she'd sweep everything and under the floor. Still in the room, but it's taken care of. It's out of sight, right? 
Well, that's what that's what the atonement did. Redemption paid for. Salvation paid for. The real taking care of sin took care took place on the cross. That's what paid the price of what had been hidden. It was hidden by faith and gave them atonement. Later, Christ came, paid for it, got rid of it. What's it say in the Bible? As far as east is from the west. west. High the heavens from the depths of the sea. It's gone. He And what he got rid of in redemption was the sin of mankind, all mankind, the whole world, from Adam to the last man. When he went to the cross, he paid for the sins of every everyone's sins paid for. Not that they're going to receive the benefit, that's by faith. But he paid for it all. God's love, what's the new text that we all memorized early in our life? John 3 16 for God so loved the world. The world. So loved the, world. the world. I just certain individual. God so loved the world that he gave. Uh, God's love is also stated where he says it's God does not desire any man to perish. God loves every man, every woman, every child. God loves everyone from Adam to the last man. <clears throat> not everyone is saved. The price has been paid, but the price may not be um, received. It may not be embraced. It may, some may not accept it. Even though the price is paid, they may not accept it. What's the good news? Your sins are all paid for. You want to take advantage of that? Yeah, I'll tell you how to cash that check. Mm -hmm. And you what you he has bought for you is eternal life. So uh, the uh, importance of that is this. Uh, God loves all men. God paid for the sins of all men, but all men are not saved. Love of God. I was going to start with it because it's a shocking statement, but it's true. God's love does not save you. God's love didn't, doesn't save. What saves? Faith. What's the Bible say? By grace. By grace. Faith. Or by grace through faith. Faith is what's saved. Where you're willing to take what he has provided, a payment of your sins, and you put your trust in that. That's the moment of redemption for you. Uh, it all goes back to the cross. So uh, it, even though atonement satisfied God for a people, in the past, what satisfies God today is uh, not animal sacrifice, but the God's own personal sacrifice in the giving of his son and his taking uh, our sins to the cross, shedding his blood, not animal blood, shedding, shedding his blood, and we accept that payment. And so that's um, a big difference. And so uh, I thought maybe there was questions, and maybe there is. If there's any, if anybody still have a, a question about the difference between atonement and redemption? Well, it says a lot of times when people are saved, several times, we were talking about that last week, Yvonne and I, that as many as were chosen were saved. Mm -hmm. Statements like that, mm -hmm. that I understand would make, so I can understand why a Calvinist would believe that, mm -hmm. because there's several statements that mm -hmm. say that. I wouldn't have an answer for him if they told me. Does uh, does God make the choice? That verse says he does. Mm -hmm. The Bible says he does. Mm -hmm. He says he made the choice before he even created us. Right. Um, does man, everyone who wants to be saved, can be saved? Mm -hmm. yes. does, does man have a choice? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. How do you put those two things together perfectly? I don't think it's humanly possible. In fact, um, uh, well, I could, think, you, could you say that God knows 
what your decision is going to be. <laughs> Well, that's not what he says. And he tries no, not based on what he is uh, omniscience. But it also says that they're not, no one can see unless the Holy Spirit opens their eyes. So they're chosen and the Holy Spirit opens their eyes. But they still have a choice to make. Mm -hmm. No. No man's going to be saved who doesn't choose to be. Nobody's going to send, uh, God is not going to judge anybody by what they haven't said. But does God give give you an offer you can't refuse? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're through Tulip today, by the way. <laughs> We've gone down that uh, rabbit hole as far as we can go because that's a that's a whole class or two yeah well if you, if you take a look at it, and I, it keeps going over my mind the offerings of the first two um gosh the first two you know, first two children Cain and Abel Cain and Abel yeah okay <laughs> one was accepted and one was not yeah I, it just keeps going through my mind that that could be something like I mean, they both brought sacrifices yes. to pay. Yes. One was accepted and one was not because right. one had it in his heart that he wanted to bring his first fruit. The other one, it wasn't really. Going through the motions. He was just going through the motions because that's what people expected him to do. Yeah. And he wanted to look that he was. Was it one was was blood and the other one wasn't too? That's, a, that's where I think the crux of it really since one was a blood sacrifice and the other wasn't right where where would should they have i believe they knew that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they were still in the garden when when adam when their parents uh, uh had to have the shedding of blood to cover their mm -hmm. nakedness their sin god did it god provided for them an example Mm -hmm. of what satisfies him. And it was a picture of the coming Messiah way back there in mm -hmm. the beginning. And that he that a blood sacrifice is what God wanted. Mm -hmm. Not the fruit of our efforts, our works, our farming, or whatever else we do. That doesn't satisfy God's uh, uh, requirements. Blood does. But because life is in the blood it's not in the carrot or the cabbage. Life is in the blood, and that's what counts. I didn't plan to do this. <laughs> it's a big light rabbit hole. <laughs> Have you heard of an antinomy? Mm -hmm. I taught it before, and you all may remember it. An antinomy is a truth. <laughs> no, here's God. I got to see how fast I can do this without destroying it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, God is omniscient. He knows everything, right? Right. And uh, here's us. I'll just say, man. We know nothing. That was nothing. <laughs> we, th we think. We think we know it. <laughs> right? How close do you think our understanding comes to God's? No. If I was to make a line, it would be down here somewhere, right? Okay. I'm going to give myself a benefit of the doubt. Let's say uh, our line of understanding is at this level. That's how close we can get to our mission. No further, right? Um, we're talking about the fact whether God makes the choice and do I make the choice? Well, uh, and so we find in Scripture that, without going into it, that uh, God has told man that uh, that he makes the choice and uh, whosoever will may come that's the other side of the same thing here god has made the choice but he also says he also says uh, that man makes the choice so you have uh, uh, on one side you have those who, uh, I'm trying to think of a single word. I'll just put here that that man, what we're seeing here, we look 
here's Ottawa. We're in this this valley here. And from where we stand, I'm black and so we see this, we say, man makes the choice. Whosoever will may come. We look over here, we see God says, He makes the choice long mm -hmm. before He even created us. Right? Mm -hmm. Um I believe I'm not Calvinist, I'm not Arminian, I'm biblical. The Bible says this, the Bible says this. My problem is I can't justify this one against that one. So what do I usually, what does man usually do? He usually picks one and champions it. So these, we, these days we call them Calvinists uh, over here because they, they think God did it. And they got plenty of proof in scripture to, to say he didn't do it. Uh, other people look over at this side, and we call these Calvinists. These we uh, call Arminian because Arminius developed the theology opposite of this one completely. And uh, so they say uh, that it's man's choice, whosoever will may come. Does the Bible say that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely does. So uh, the error that I'm trying to expose is that some of us look in one direction and champion it, whether it's that way or this way. If we believe God's word, I have to believe that and I have to believe that. Problem is I don't know how to put them together. In my poor little mind, I can't justify the two. Got to be one or the other. No, no. God's bigger than my little mind. Therefore, I'll never figure out how they go together until God calls me home and he can reveal it to me. The answer is in, I believe, the Bible. Yeah, and God also says, my thoughts are your thoughts, my way are his way. So, yeah. So, I was saying the most challenging example of that for me is, is when he talks about Jacob and Esau. He's like, before they were born, yeah. they had the chance to do good or evil. <laughs> for my purpose, I determined that the young, the younger shall serve the elder shall serve the younger. And Esau or uh, Jacob, I loved, and Esau, I hated. Yeah. That's a that's a hard one to, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I. Who <laughs> toward me? And you know, does he love me or does he hate me? Loves you, yeah. And so, but I, but what made the difference in Jacob and Esau? I came to the service, surfaced with the uh, moving along of time and experience. And uh, we, I don't want to make that a whole lesson either, but that's a, an interesting lesson, and it's so you're right, it is so clear uh, in both of them. But the thing is. Uh, uh, to believe God's word and to be, um, I don't know if I'm coining that term out of biblicist. I believe whatever the Bible says. Uh, I got. I am satisfied that by faith, there's an answer to how they fit together. He hasn't revealed it to me yet, but in his omniscience, I know that it does go together. So by faith, I'm going to accept both of them. I know I've got a choice. If I go to hell, I'll be my choice. God already paid for my sin. I don't have to go. Well, I do have a choice. And uh, we know that the other scripture that was mentioned, I think Jim mentioned it, uh, <laughs> that uh, every man's a sinner. And uh, and uh, God works in lives to bring them to himself. So he's made a decision. And he's he, how he does it is different probably from person to person. But he brings us to himself because of his choice and my choice have to work together. They do work together. Mm -hmm. If it was if we were left to our own devices, we would have all gone to hell. Mm -hmm. Left to our own devices, we would have gone to hell. It was God moving in us, circumstances of life, and in our minds and in our hearts to comprehend the offer that He's making. And uh, he works in us to draw us to himself. And uh, so the choice is his. Well, I think that's what I would just say to a person that's questioning that. Yeah. You know, regardless, if you 
know you're a sinner yeah. and you want to follow God through Jesus, you can be saved and you can use either side you want. I think it is. That's called in, um, in school, they call that an antenna. <clears throat> There are other other antinomies in scripture as well. That's only one of them. So what is an antinomy exactly? Uh, antinomy. Yeah, you know what anti is. What? We know what that's right. There's anti against harm. And this is namas is the basic word here. That's where at nama antinomy. This means uh uh law or word. Uh it's what the word itself means is there's two two truths, if you want to call it that, two truths that can't be justified, they work against each other. That's why some think, why some are, are uh, uh, Calvinist and the other ones are Arminius. Oh, well, no, I mean, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that, that it's, it's laws, two, two laws in existence that deny one another. De the dictionary definition is a contradiction between two beliefs. Or conclusions that are in themselves reasonable mm -hmm. or a paradox. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right out of the dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> so, what you said about that, that's a paradox. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. That's what we shouldn't waste our time arguing. No one's going to, you're going to go round and round and round and never figure it out. Well, yes, in one way, that's, that's true. Another way uh, to say that is uh, that shows us that we need to pay attention and search the word of God for both things mm -hmm. and know what God says about man's responsibility and know what God's word says about his responsibility. Then you got it right. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be able to justify it, but you got to know what God's word says about each mm -hmm. aspect of it. That that was uh, not in my notes for today. <laughs> Can I just say one thing? Sure. Going back to propitiation, yeah. the word that keeps coming to my mind is substitutionary. Yes, not quite all. But it has to be an acceptable substitution, right? Yeah. Yes, I'm assuming you're making the comparison <laughs> between bulls and goats. Yeah, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, and then Jesus. in the Lord's. Sacrifice yeah. as my substitute, right? Uh, on the cross, mm -hmm. yeah. Scripture tells us that He took us to the cross, that we were with Him on the cross, mm -hmm. uh, and that we were with Him in death and burial, and that we're with Him in resurrection. That's why someone who's not a Christian and then don't live like one mm -hmm. uh, need to re-examine themselves, because a person who has died and been raised to newness of life. Can't live like he used to. Just go to First John, right? Go to First John. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. I got that in my Bible. That whole, <laughs> that whole thing, yeah. Um, when Christ is living in an individual, along with the with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, along with the Father, um, when His presence is in us and never ceases to be within us. We can't live. There's a passage I forget now where I look at. It says that the believer can't sin. He can't sin. And I, what they're pointing to at that point is uh, it's in the tense that man can't uh, sin as a habit, as a way of life. The indwellingness of divinity within him won't permit it. Mm -hmm. If he disciplines every child as his, if you're if you don't get a licking once in a while, um, especially if you've been doing things wrong, then you got re reason to think uh, 
you know, about uh, his, about really being saved or not. And uh, because he disciplines every child of his, and um, even to the point where if they don't respond, you're there in a situation and uh, they know they're doing wrong and they're sinning, they confess it, but they go on. Um, and, and a little later, sin again, maybe in a different way. But the, the sin stays in and then God disciplines them. And they move on. God disciplines them. And they move on. They, God disciplines them and they move on. And they, they don't respond to God in the right way. Uh, God's final discipline is to remove them. <clears throat> like he did Ananias and Sapphira. Like he's done others. Uh, uh, what's Mr. Mighty Man that Samson? Samson. You know, like Samson, <laughs> there is a discipline that leads to death, physical death. Uh, and uh, if you're one of his children, you're going to be disciplined. And of course, uh, uh, if you're categorizing disciplines, the final one, of course, is God removes removing your candle, your your um, testimony from the world because you've been a child you can't leave here any longer according to his uh, decision making and he takes you home so it's the unbelievers he turns them over to their own desires they're already living according to their own desires um a uh, when he lets go i mean there's a point is it i thought it was a believer who was doing a particular sin mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. and he's doing He's doing it regularly as a way of life. Yeah. I just wondered if there was a point where he just let, okay. He disciplines and he, he never just lets them go. He disciplines us. Okay. If we're living uh, simply, uh, we're representing him to a lost world in the wrong way. You don't want to leave that testimony there. Uh, he never just lets us go. He disciplines us. What changes is the way he disciplines us. You know, if breaking your leg won't work, I'll mm -hmm. break something else. He won't, you know, I'll, if five legs don't seem to work, I'll give you 10 legs. I don't know. I'm just saying. Like miracles. He put mud on one person and then he just called another person and then he didn't do them the same way every time. Mm -hmm. No, because we're different. And so, yeah. And the discipline will be different. Yeah, yeah. Like I probably needed a few more licks than can. <laughs> we all probably uh, yeah. qualify for more. Of it. And I think sometimes uh, we don't take the discipline as discipline. We think it's uh, it's life. It's life. Uh, <clears throat> but sometimes it is. Sin brings discipline. Uh, because we have a, a Heavenly Father who loves us. He cares about our lifestyle. Plus, he cares about how we're his priesthood in the world today to reveal him to those who don't know him. We don't want to mess that up. That's why the high priest going into the Holy of Holies needed to have a, <laughs> a chain on, around him so that they could pull him out if he wasn't. Yeah, because there are some serious consequences to. Barry, you brought us back to the mercy seat. <laughs> I was trying to try for ten minutes. <laughs> right. Uh, God is wonderful, and uh, He was wonderful in Old Testament days, and He's wonderful too. He gave away for man back then through a shadow. Being obedient, loving him. And now that we have the uh, the blood sacrifice of the Redeemer, uh, it, it's a better covenant. It's a better promise. That's what scripture calls it, a better promise. Better, better covenant. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> uh, we're talking, uh, we're supposed to finish today. The high priest's uh, worship before the mercy seat. Oh. We have to remember, we're going to be taking a look at the high priest of the, of the Old Testament uh, and the, his uh, 
uh, ministering at the mercy seat. And uh, I bring that up because there was a whole castle, hundreds of priests in Israel that day. Those priests couldn't go back there. The priests couldn't go uh, before the mercy seat. Only the high, the high priest could go behind the mercy seat. I said behind, behind the curtain into the mercy seat. Mine's going faster than my words. <laughs> Who's the high uh, high priest today? <laughs> He's Jesus Christ. He is our great high priest. Who are we today? Priest, just a regular priest. We're, we're priests. Priest kings. And we're uh, we're priests uh, that um, uh, a holy priesthood. Hebrews tells us we're a holy priesthood. So if we're going to kind of make a comparison between Old Testament days and New Testament days, we're saying, okay, they had a high priest, a human one made of blood who would die in time. But he had the role of a high priest. And his job uh, was to serve uh, the needs of Israel to Israel's God. That's what his uh, responsibility was. Today, our high priest is, is the Lord himself. And he uh, is to work in the, uh, the lives of his priests to accomplish a work we find described for us in the New Testament, where every priest is a special person because every priest today is a believer. We are believer priests. That's what the New Testament calls us from Hebrew. We're the believer priests. And uh, God, uh, in the person of Christ, is our high priest. And what's the Bible tell us? He is the, the head of the church. What's the church? It's the body of Christ. The body of today's priests. We're the priests of today. And what is God supposed to, what does God tell us he's doing in us? Well. He started us out with life and gifts uh, for ministry. Every single person who's born again is a gifted priest to be serving him in some particular special way. And in our day, people who think they're people who claim to be Christians don't have a clue that that's who they are and that they are gifted for service in some special way. Uh, I'm going to leave that picture in your mind because we're going to go back just to looking at the Old Testament high priest who was a man, wasn't the person of Christ. It was a chosen man from the tribe of Levi who was the high priest, the Aaronic priesthood and his family on down. And they were to serve God in this one unique way. They were to represent once a year the whole nation. The regular priesthood help the individual people of Israel when they bring their sacrifices, but they didn't go behind, they didn't go to the mercy seat to do it. That, that entrance only happened once a year, and you know, mm -hmm. during the Day of Atonement. Regular priesthood was serving the people before God. So here we're talking about the high priest uh, of that day. And um, I'm kind of presetting your mind, and I don't like to do that. I'd rather go through something step by step or piece by piece and give you the opportunity to, oh, I see, I can put it together. But what I what we're going to look at here quickly in the book of Leviticus, for the most part, is that the, the high priest has to start in a one particular place and move on from there. Uh, he We're going to read that he has to deal with the blood sacrifice. And then he goes on, and we're going to see why. Uh, this, this is uh, foreshadowing the blood of Christ. Then he moves on to something else that illustrates or uh, foreshadows a, him as a faithful intercessor. Then from there, we move on to another situation where he foreshadows 
his uh, null sufficiency. Uh, that's the uh, name uh, for that in the Bible is that is is the word um, uh, the title of God that uh, is given to him it's called the um, what's the one that means all sufficient? Trying to tip me point. El Shaddai. You've heard songs about El Shaddai. El Shaddai, uh, which means he's also he more than efficient. You can't stump him. You can't uh, ask for more than he can handle. He's all sufficient in every situation. I'll move on to another uh, situation where he demonstrates that he is a cleanser. Uh, because mankind, whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, man messes up. Man sins. Man fails. And he knows it. But you know what? Our, the, the high priest can take care of that as a cleanser. Uh, then he, they finally get, the priest goes in, uh, the high priest goes in into the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat is, the place that's where he can make propitiation for the nation. He goes in there and uh, with the sacrifice that demonstrate, uh, comes out uh, with his chain, he comes out with the answer to the people. He just doesn't take care of business and then say nothing. He goes in there he, uh, with this, uh, we'll read about the sacrifices and so on, and what he does with them in there, right in the presence where, where God is, right where uh, he's going to demonstrate the price of life. And, uh, and if God is happy, if God is satisfied, if God has been propitiated, he gets to come out. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he does is he tells the nation. And it's very interesting how he does this. Comes out and tells the nation. And uh, don't you think that makes him think? <laughs> right? <laughs> you can always hear it. Uh, what that says to me is he comes out and this high priest uh, pictures the assurance that comes when God is propitiated, we would call that assurance. Oh, he's happy. The priest lived, the high priest lived. He comes out to tell us God's answer. Yeah. Is the nation, nation's guilt taken care of? Yeah, God was happy. Then he um, gives us another experience we'll read on, where he demonstrates that uh, the high priest uh, is a good example of imputation. Um, if you're not sure what imputation means, it's just a banking term. It means you put something to someone's account. Now, it could be something good or something bad. <laughs> you could put a bill to my account. I don't like that. No, but imputation means it's put on the, your record uh, to impute. And there's a um, imputation is. Uh, Circular. In the Bible's uh, description of imputation is he takes all of my sin, puts it on Christ, puts it on his account. And he takes the righteousness of Christ <clears throat> and he puts that on my account. So you see, it can be something good, something bad. He takes all my sin, puts it on Christ, takes all Christ's righteousness, puts it on my account. That's in, they're imputing. That's where that word comes from. And then finally, we're going to look at uh, uh, a passage that illustrates for us uh, that God's answer to uh, uh, the um, pictures or the foreshadowings of the Old Testament, the answer to that then. Uh, results in the end demonstration of the real satisfaction, the real propitiation in the blood of Christ as expiation. It's never called atonement. It's called by us salvation or redemption. 
a couple other names, but uh, the difference is what's done with sin. In the Old Testament, it got covered up and put in place until someone could, blood could actually pay for it, be worth of it and value and pay for it. And then, then when that sacrifice happens, uh, all this comes out to be expiation. And expiation of sin means it's not covered up anymore. <clears throat> it's removed. Yeah, Peter. Um, they had a, oh, I wanted I want to say another thing about uh, redemption and atonement. In many of our Bibles, you'll find um, there's only, I'm going to make a point. Atonement is an Old Testament word. It's not in the New Testament, except one place. And it's in that one place when it's quoting an Old Testament passage. You won't find, in other words, you won't find, you won't find atonement in the New Testament. It's not there because sins aren't covered up anymore. Mm -hmm. They're removed. They're gotten rid of. They're destroyed. They're gone. And uh, so, uh, but you'll find a lot of commentaries uh, and scholars who will, for some reason, keep on using for redemption in the New Testament. They'll keep re they'll keep describing it as atonement. You'll find it in a lot of good men's writings and preachings. When they talk about salvation and they use the word atonement, they're using the wrong word. Uh, the uh, word, there's other words that are in, all over in the New Testament, but atonement isn't one of them. That's an Old Testament word. So when it talks about the, the, what God's work does with sin is not a cover-up, but a removal. I got rid of, and that's why the theologians like the word expiation. I don't know why they like big words. I can't remember them half the time. Expiate means get rid of. What's the uh, dictionary say? Oh, expiation? Expiation. <laughs> Hope it doesn't say atonement. It's utterly destroyed. <laughs> better not say atonement. <laughs> no. It <laughs> might. <laughs> The Benz who wrote that dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the act of making amends or reparation for guilt or wrongdoing. Atonement. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Can't win for losing. <laughs> okay, we've got five minutes. To spend in Leviticus chapter 16. <laughs> and we can push it off another weekend. <laughs> sure. Uh, we're just um, in uh, Leviticus 16 is that section where it's talking about the Day of Atonement work of the high priest, or, uh, which they call Yom Kippur. Or mm -hmm. Yom Kippur, I'm not sure I'll say it. Uh, but uh, and in chapter 16 uh, starts out with that that uh, course in telling us about uh, uh, Aaron's two sons that went into the into there uh, in error in the wrong way. Uh, you don't take God's word that lightly, and so uh, uh, the Lord took their life. They were. They were priests, uh, ironic priests, mm -hmm. and um, they went in there, and and the and the Lord uh, took. Remember their names? Phineas. Nadab was one of them, and oh. you and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu went in there, and God took them. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord uh, told Aaron through Moses. There, He says, "Tell your brother Aaron." That he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil. That would be the holy of holies. Before the mercy seat on which, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud. How will he appear? Over the mercy seat. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull or a sin offering and a ram. For a burnt offering. Um, 
And he starts in verse four telling you that even Aaron can't just walk in there. Aaron has to go in uh, the way the Lord told him to. He's got to start by getting all undressed and taking a bath bodily. Got to take a bath in verse uh, four. And um, then he shall bathe his body in water and put put on different clothing. Uh, his regular priestly garment isn't uh, sufficient. He's got to have special clothes for this entrance into the very presence of uh, the Lord there at the mercy seat. So Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin. I'm in uh, verse 6 of chapter 16. Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which he is for himself, and he may make atonement for it for himself and for his family, for his household. And so before, before he even uh, has this mercy seat ministry, he's got to bathe, got to change into special clothing, and then he makes a sin offering that's, all, that's only applicable to just to him and his family. And he's starting with blood, because he started with those animal sacrifices. Verse 11, then, then you notice I have up here, then, 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 because mm -hmm. all down through this chapter, you're going to see it that way. Mm -hmm. Then he's going to do certain things, and then a time word. Then, in other words, after that's done, then I do something else, and he goes on. Well, so after uh, Aaron has made this uh, ceremonial and uh, sacrificial uh, offering for him, just himself and his family, then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement. See, atonement means more now. Now the cover-up for himself and for his household, he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. So here we've got uh, the beginning, with, and he's starting with a sin offering for himself and his family. And then uh, we go to verse 12, and he shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. Where does he get the fire? From the altar. Mm -hmm. So he had to leave what he was doing, go out of the tabernacle to the altar of sacrifice. Now he went back out uh, to get, he went out there to get some uh, coals of fire. And still in verse 12, um, to take before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire once he's in there before the Lord. Uh, and the cloud that will make this incense burn on these hot coals, and it creates a smoke. So uh, this smoke, you get enough, but you call it a cloud. And he uh, put the incense in the fire, verse 13, before the Lord. And the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony, lest what? Uh, lest he die. If you don't do this, God's going to take them. You, you think this was serious? <laughs> yeah. If you're the high priest, it's serious. <laughs> yeah, it's serious. It's serious to God. That's what makes it matter. Mm -hmm. Serious to God. And he had to do this. Um, so um, here he is uh, in this, taking this uh, uh, smoking incense in there, and it fills up the Holy of Holies. And, and what does that smoke represent? You remember? Uh, prayers. Prayers, 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 saints, all the concern of believers. And especially in this case, all the believers of Israel. These were the prayers of Israel. No small thing. God doesn't consider our prayers insignificant. They are tremendously so important for him. And in doing what he's doing here, the first thing 
he's demonstrating that is that then he's going to see, show himself as a faithful intercessor. Now he's not doing something for himself. He's doing something for the whole nation under God's control. Uh, and that uh, he is uh, on his way to uh, minister in the Holy of Holies. He's um, going before God with all the needs uh, of the people. He is a faithful intercessor. And with that, you got to stop. And we'll pick up the next then next week. So uh let's see.